in the Book of Mormon, wars and the conflict over freedom and liberty is a central theme. The Book of Mormon teaches us how to navigate during times of war. It teaches us the dangers and the warnings in a society politically. And in our lesson today, we're going to talk about the dangers of corrupt lawyers and judges, both in the Nephite time period and in our own day. The Book of Mormon has been emphasized to us over and over and over again as being written specifically for our day and being a critical work of scripture that we should be studying really daily. Well, why? What makes it different than other works of scripture like the Doctrine and Covenants and the Bible and the Pearl of Great Price? All of them testify of Jesus Christ. All of them teach doctrine. All of them help us to repent. So what makes the Book of Mormon unique? Well, one of the things that sets the Book of Mormon apart is the emphasis on themes of war and the themes of liberty and freedom, constitutional rights and liberty. Why would this be a central theme of scripture? Well, because the gospel is a message of liberty. It's about personal freedom. It's about societal freedom, family freedom, governmental freedom. Everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ is about setting us free. And so for the Book of Mormon to emphasize what those liberties look like at a national level is not only just a part of the gospel or important, but I would submit that it's a very, very central theme. And Mormon knew this. The writers of the Book of Mormon knew this. And this is why it is so important and it is included in our day. In Mosiah 29, Mosiah sets up a free government of liberty in the Book of Mormon. And almost immediately, there are attacks and threats to that liberty. In chapters 2 and 3 of the Book of Alma, immediately, we see fights for freedom. We see Amlesi and Alma going head to head as this threat comes in to try to take away the freedom of the Nephites. If we then go to our own day, we see that right from the get-go, right as the government of liberty was being established by the founding fathers in America, also as Joseph Smith began restoring greater principles of liberty in his own day in the 1840s in Nauvoo as he was setting up the Council of Fifty and teaching things about the kingdom of God. During the same period, both in the United States but also the world, we see parallel fights for freedom where those principles, the principles in the Book of Mormon, the principles Joseph Smith was teaching, the principles of the Founding Fathers actually help address and give answers to those struggles. You have in the early 1900s, in 1926 to 1929, in Mexico, you had the Cristero War. And this is, if you don't know about this movement, you have to watch the movie For Greater Glory. It is absolutely phenomenal, incredible. It's the amazing story of how the government in Mexico tried to silence religious freedom, shut down the Catholic Church. And the people, just as peasants with no military expertise on their side, without really the needed ammunition and supplies, they stood up and they rallied for religious freedom, and they were able to preserve that in their country. We are an army fighting for God and for the church. We will fight with honor and dignity. United States. We've been following your war with the Catholic Church. I would hardly call it a war. If you lose this war, we're not going to lose this war. Today we're going to send a message. Freedom is our home, our wives, our children, and we will defend it like that tribe. Que viva Cristo Rey! You have Benito Juarez, also in Mexico. Um, he was a man who endeavored to establish liberty and fight for liberty and free rights in Mexico. Well, after he passed away, he was one of the men who came with the signers and the other eminent men of Wilford Woodruff to the St. George Temple and asked for his temple work to be done. This is the story, of course, when the founders come to Wilford Woodruff and they say, we laid the foundations of liberty, do our temple work. Well, Benito Juarez was actually one of those men, and there is actually a movie you can watch on his life. You have so many of these struggles of for liberty going on, some good, some not so good. You have the French Revolution, you have other wars going on around the world. And the reason why I bring this up is because as we're studying history and as we're trying to understand 
the world and understand and be able to discern, correctly discern, you know, who's right, who's wrong, how do we understand these periods of history, we should be using the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon gives us principles to navigate history and judge. And the Book of Mormon is not just for Americans. You know, as we've been talking about in these podcasts, we've talked a lot about American history. We've talked a lot about the pilgrims and the Puritans and the founding fathers and the pioneers. But these principles are for all. There have been struggles for liberty around the entire world. The message of the gospel has been going throughout the entire world. It will continue to go throughout the entire world. And the principles and the parallels in the Book of Mormon are meant for all all of God's children. And we should be using the Book of Mormon. You know, I would love to see if there is someone listening to this who writes history curriculum or is interested in writing curriculum or or writing historical um, books or textbooks. You know, we need a history curriculum that uses the Book of Mormon that's designed with the Book of Mormon saying, okay, here's what the Book of Mormon teaches and here's these principles and let's use those principles to interpret um, periods of history, everything from the Cristero War to Napoleon Bonaparte to the French Revolution to American history, all of these periods of history, wouldn't it be incredible to have a history curriculum that used the Book of Mormon in that way? Um, but just to come back to the subject that we're actually talking about here today, um, using the Book of Mormon to address not just the spiritual principles, quote unquote, because technically everything in God's world is spiritual. There is no difference between temporal or spiritual. The things we kind of see as spiritual, yes, the Book of Mormon addresses those, but we also need to be using the Book of Mormon to address political principles, issues in our society, and that is what we are going to see in these chapters of Alma as Alma and Amulek go head to head with corrupt lawyers and judges in the city of Ammonihah. So now moving to our section this week, we're in Alma chapter 8. Alma goes to Ammonihah and he tries to preach the gospel, but he is rejected. And so he's leaving. He's going to a different city and the Lord tells him, no, you got to go back. You have to go back and call these people and warn them one last time because they are about to be destroyed. Um, The people are non-members. They're not really part of the church, uh, but... The Lord wants them to know that if they do not repent, they are going to be destroyed. And this is in Alma 8, verses 16 through 17. Alma is having this conversation with an angel. And this angel tells him, I've been sent by the Lord to command thee that thou return to the city of Ammonihah. Preach to the people of the city. Preach to them. Say to them that except they repent, the Lord God will destroy them. Why? Why are they about to be destroyed? For behold, they do study at this time that they may destroy the liberty of thy people. So there was this movement in Ammonihah where the people were conspiring and studying. How could they destroy the liberty of the people, destroy the Nephite government, and take away these rights and these privileges that Mosiah had instituted through the laws of Mosiah, through this constitutional government, to provide this Republican government of liberty. And they're trying to overrule that and destroy it. And this is, thus saith the Lord, this is contrary to the statutes and judgments and commandments which he has given unto his people. Now, remember, who is the audience that Alma is talking to here? In the next chapter, it's specifically identified these people in Ammonihah weren't Lamanites or they weren't degenerate people who had never had access to the gospel. They were actually the descendants of men and women who had been given the gospel. So they were rejecting light and knowledge. And this is why when Alma goes to them, he says, I say unto you, it will be more tolerable for the Lamanites in the day of judgment than for you. Because he says, why? You know, you had access to the gospel. You had access to light and you are rejecting it and you are fighting against it. So if we go into our day and we're looking for the parallels, right? Where where can we see these parallels with Ammonihah? Where do we see the, the dangers? Where do we see the same things happening in our own history? Well, we need to be looking to people who have had the miracles, who have had access to the gospel, um, and who are rejecting the gospel and therefore are becoming even more wicked. And so the Lord says, you know what? I can have mercy on those who didn't sin against light, but you have sinned against light, so you will be destroyed. And the point in these chapters, the point that we are going to see as you're studying these chapters and Alma is talking to the people in Ammonihah is 
that really at its core, if we're going to simplify down the message, is that there were these lawyers and these judges who were manipulating the legal system, the government, to make preaching the gospel illegal, to make it hate speech, essentially, and to change the laws so that the people would ultimately be destroyed, that the nation would be destroyed and the the liberty would be destroyed. Again, this point is emphasized in Alma chapter 10, verse 27. Now behold, I say unto you that the foundation of the destruction of this people is beginning to be laid by who? By the unrighteousness of your lawyers and your judges. Now, why would Mormon be putting this in the Book of Mormon for our day, right? We need to be asking the question that Ezra Taft Benson said we need to ask continually. Every line, every verse in the Book of Mormon, we need to be asking ourselves, why did Mormon put this in the Book of Mormon? What am I supposed to learn about this for my day and age? Well, let's take a step back here and look at the history of how we got to the point where we are today in the American nation of our society and our civilization really falling apart. The reason why I am bringing up America specifically when we all know that there is corruption and issues all over the world is because if you look in the Book of Mormon and specifically the story with Ammonihah, the people in Ammonihah were people who had been given access to liberty. They'd been given access to the gospel. They knew the truth and they were turning against it. And in our day, what nation and what people has been blessed more than any other? What nation has been given access to all of the principles, the teachings, access to the gospel, access to liberty more than any other? And yet, as a people, they're rejecting that light and knowledge and they are subverting the foundations, the Christian foundations given to them, laying the foundation for destruction. And we're going to look at the Book of Mormon and then we're going to look at our day and ask, is the foundation of our own destruction in our day also being laid by our lawyers and our judges? I'm going to play a short clip here from a documentary called Agenda Grinding America Down. It was produced by a homeschool father and also an Idaho legislator, a former Idaho legislator named Curtis Bowers, who produced a documentary about the infiltration of America by specific communist groups and agendas, that there was a plan that was set many, many decades ago of how to take America out from within. He went to a meeting in California when he was just a young man where this agenda was outlined and he thought, this will never happen in my day. This is radical. This is crazy. And yet decades later, he sat down one day and realized, wait a minute, America has radically changed in the last 30, 40 years. And those goals are literally being accomplished. This is his story. This story really begins for me back in the summer of 1992. I got a phone call from an older gentleman I knew who was a writer. And he asked me if I'd go attend a meeting for him at the University of California, Berkeley. He told me that the Communist Party USA had recently split over differences of how to best take America down. Some were wanting to still work toward a violent revolution, while others were wanting to focus their efforts on using public policy to subvert America from the inside. He was curious what they had to say. I mean, after all, the Berlin Wall had just come down, the Soviet Union had dissolved, and the whole world was saying, communism is dead. So why were they meeting, and what were they up to? I was in graduate school at the time, and the whole idea of slipping in undercover into a communist meeting sounded pretty neat, so I decided to go. The first surprise I had was when I walked into the auditorium. I was expecting it to be filled with college radicals, but instead it was 50, 60, and 70-year-olds, I mean grandparents, professionally dressed with briefcases, and I realized, this might be a little more serious than I thought. As the weekend unfolded, I listened carefully as they outlined their plan and agenda and how they were going to infiltrate the institutions of America to influence us in the direction they wanted us to go. To destroy our families, they wanted to promote cohabitation instead of marriage. They wanted to try to get children away into government programs at the earliest age possible 
And they also said they'd like to get behind the feminist movement because they felt it had been very successful in making women discontent with marriage and motherhood. To destroy business, they wanted to get behind the environmental movement. And in 1992, the environmental movement was very modest, but they thought it was the only vehicle capable of creating enough regulation and red tape to discourage business growth. And finally, to destroy our culture of religion and morality, they said, if we can get Americans to accept homosexuality, they thought it would begin to extinguish our traditional moral values Americans held. I remember thinking at the time, this plan doesn't seem very realistic. It's not something I'll need to worry about in my lifetime. It was 15 years later, I was appointed by the governor to be a state representative in the legislature. I'd only lived in my district for two years, so I thought it'd be a good idea if I wrote a monthly letter to the editor. Each month I wrote on a different topic. In January 2008, as I was contemplating what to write my letter on, I thought back to the meeting in 1992, and I thought of the goals they'd outlined and where America was today, and I couldn't believe how successful they had been. I mean, our families were totally disintegrating, the environmental movement had become the most powerful force for destroying our free markets, and hate crimes legislation was being considered in Washington, D.C. that made it a crime to even say anything against the homosexual movement. I realized people needed to know what was going on. After I wrote this letter, within days, people were protesting at the Capitol, it was the feature story on the evening news. Controversial comments have state legislators buzzing tonight. After a freshman lawmaker alleges the communist agenda has infiltrated mainstream America. It's the big story, live at 6. And over 40 letters to the editor had been printed in response to what I'd said. Hey, I just wanted to give you support on your newspaper article. Don't let them grind you down. Bye. I realized then I'd hit on something. One of the letters written in my defense stated that a book from 1958 had outlined a similar agenda. And this got my attention. The book was The Naked Communist by Cleon Skousen, who had been a former FBI agent. And inside the book, it documented 45 current communist goals from 1958. And as I slowly read through the list, seeing how specific their agenda had been to subvert us on the inside, I couldn't believe it. They'd accomplished almost every single one of them, and nobody seemed to be noticing. For at least the last 50 years, they'd been working actively behind the scenes, in the shadows, trying to move our people and our culture in a direction that was designed to destroy us. Now, Curtis Bowers in this documentary mentions the book, The Naked Communist. Curtis Bowers is not a member of the church, but it's kind of fun that he specifically spotlighted The Naked Communist by W. Cleon Skousen because Cleon Skousen was a member of the church 
And President David O. McKay actually got up in general conference when The Naked Communist was published, and he publicly admonished the Latter-day Saints. He told them, I admonish you, go read The Naked Communist, go read this book. So it's kind of fun to see someone who is not a member of the church um, drawing that connection and being affected by that book. Um, but the point that Cleon Skousen made in The Naked Communist that President David O. McKay wanted all the members of the church to become aware of all the way back many, many, many decades ago, and the same point that Curtis Bowers was trying to make in this documentary was that America, our society, our culture, our standards has been changed through this specific agenda that sounds, wait, this sounds like conspiracy. This sounds like, um, you know, tinfoil hat. No, it's actually documented and we can see it happening in our day. But if we take a step back and say, wait, how did this happen? How did these changes in our media, the promotion of homosexual marriage, the promotion of the feminist movement, the environmental movement, the public school system, removing God, all of these specific plans that men and women with communist agendas said, you know, if we can do this in America, we'll be able to take out America from within. How was that accomplished? Well, President Benson and other leaders have brought out the point that the one of the greatest threats and one of the greatest, most effective um, agencies to make these changes in America was done through the court system. This is what President Benson said. He said, quote, almost everyone recognizes that something is wrong with the Supreme Court, and one does not have to be a constitutional lawyer to sense it. After a decade or more of court decisions following a consistent and recognizable pattern, crime now runs rampant in the street. Subversives who are openly dedicated to the destruction of our way of life operate in our midst with complete impunity, and government has grown to gigantic proportions never envisaged by the framers of our Constitution. If one looks closely, the hand of the modern Supreme Court can be found in all of these major developments." End quote. Back in Lesson 3 in this podcast, we talked about the Supreme Court's decision to remove prayer and then later the Bible and other influences of religion and Christian faith from the public schools of America. And that when this decision was made in the 1960s, David O. McKay was distraught. And he made a public statement about how the Supreme Court was leading the nation of the United States down the road to atheism and how serious this was and that the consequences would be grievous. We talked about this in this podcast about how you can actually look statistically and see the changes and the effect on America, on, on students, on marriage, on our crime rates ever since prayer and the Bible were removed from the public government schools. Now, of course, there were many changes going on in the 1960s, and I'm not going to discount that. Um, there were many changes and movements that, of course, contributed to this downfall of our values and our family systems and contributed to the rising crime rate. But it's just so prophetic how David O. McKay and Boyd K. Packer and others lamented and they warned the Latter-day Saints that this decision made by the Supreme Court would have serious, serious consequences. And now here we are decades later, reaping the effects of those consequences. And we can say they were truly inspired men of God and they were right. But back to this point made by President Ezra Taft Benson in his book, An Enemy Hath Done This. He says the Supreme Court can be found in all of these major developments of the downfall of the American nation. He says, quote, Decisions of the modern Supreme Court have undermined the forces of law and order, and more than any other single cause, are directly responsible for the nation's soaring crime rate. In one decision after another, the court has closed its eyes to the facts of life regarding the true nature of communism. Decisions of the modern Supreme Court have given tremendous aid and comfort to our communist enemy, end quote. I believe that this is one of the reasons, just one, why Mormon specifically included the story of Ammonihah, where Alma and Amulek were warning the people in Ammonihah, warning these Nephites, 
Guys, the foundation of the destruction of the entire Nephite nation is being laid by who? The lawyers and the judges. Again, why did Mormon put this in there? Why did he need us to know that this would be relevant in our day? Another point that's brought up in the Book of Mormon, this is back in Mosiah 29, when Mosiah is teaching his people principles of liberty, he says, it is not common that the voice of the people desireth anything contrary to that which is right. It is common for the lesser part of the people, he says, to desire that which is not right. Therefore, this is why, he says, shall ye observe and make it your law to do your business by the voice of the people. He's saying, in general, the majority want what's good. The majority want the right thing. He says, if the time comes that the voice of the people choose iniquity, then is the time that the judgments of God will come upon you. And then, yea, then is the time he will visit you with great destruction even as he has hitherto visited this land, end quote. This is the same in our day. It's very interesting to actually look at some of the statistics for some of the Supreme Court decisions that have not been good, that have not desired or put into effect in our land and by policy, moral principles, Christian principles, or even constitutional principles. And yet, if you look at statistically what the majority of the people wanted or want, it was actually the opposite. There's a clip from this video by David Barton and Rick Green talking about the judicial system, talking about a constitutional principles about how the Supreme Court is supposed to operate. And they actually show that so many times the opinion of the majority was the opposite of the court system. Washington and Jefferson, two totally different political parties. One's a Federalist, one's an Anti-Federalist, but they totally agreed on this idea. The fundamental principle of our Constitution requires that the will of the majority shall prevail. If you get away from that, you're going to start getting bad law. Lots of examples of anti-majoritarianism. You take gay marriage, 72% are against it in America, and yet we keep having it forced on us by the courts. You take prayer in school, 82% of Americans say they want it, yet the courts keep siding with the minority. Teaching both evolution and intelligent design, 68% of Americans say to do that, yet the courts keep preventing us from being able to present both sides. Abortion, 70% of Americans want some sort of restrictions on abortion, always having all kinds of overturning by the court because they side with the minority over the majority. Ten Commandments hanging in the school, 76% of Americans say do it. Courts keep uh, overruling it because they're siding with the minority. Under God and the Pledge, 90%. I think it was Robert Kennedy said, you're always going to have 20% against everything. Well, in this case, we got 90% for it, and yet the courts still often say no to that. That's the Ninth Circuit, of course, and out there on the left coast. As fortunately, the Supreme Court said you got that one wrong and didn't give them uh, jurisdiction on that one. But anyway, so you know, it's just a bad idea to think that the minority should have the um, that the Bill of Rights is there to protect, or that the judiciary is there to protect the minority over the majority. I believe this is one of the reasons that Mormon is specifically putting in the Book of Mormon. Look, the majority of the people will usually want what is good. Use the voice of the people. Allow them to speak. And yet, just a few chapters later in the Book of Alma, we see them warning. Your lawyers are manipulating your system. The judges are manipulating this uh, government system to lay the foundation of your destruction. Because what happens when the courts force the opposite? Right? What happens when the people as a whole, as a majority, would want what was good, and yet the courts force the opposite? Well, what happens? Over time, the people adapt to the new cultural standard, and then they begin wanting wickedness, right? Rising generations grow up and say, yeah, no, we don't want prayer in the Bible in school. No, we don't want or need these property rights. Or, oh, this is just normal for the government to have this growing encroachment of power. They're used to it. And so over time, the people adapt, the majority changes, and then the people are destroyed. In the Set the Course section of this lesson, we have some excellent videos, especially a few by David Barton, talking about the judicial system, talking about the Supreme Court, talking about what the Founding Fathers' vision in the Constitution actually was, how it's supposed to operate, how they have so much power today 
that was never meant to be theirs, that the founding fathers never wanted to be theirs. And more than that, that the founding fathers were afraid. They were very afraid that the Supreme Court would turn into the system that was interpreting law and creating policy and doing things that they were never intended to have the power to do. So you can go to those videos in our resources. They're completely free. And you can learn about this and teach your children, educate yourself how the courts are supposed to operate and how do we hold the courts accountable. Now, in these videos and others, there is a big push towards knowing the Constitution, that we don't know the Constitution and we need to study the Constitution. And I agree. I'm not opposed to that. But even more, we do not know the Book of Mormon as well as we should. And I would submit that if we really want to make effectual change, if we want to understand how the court systems are supposed to work, what true principles of liberty there are, and more importantly, what to do about it, the Book of Mormon should be our first manual and our textbook for liberty, even ahead of the Constitution, even ahead of the Founding Fathers. It's simple. All of the principles are there, and they're provided in such a way that anyone can understand. Everything else is important. The Founding Fathers, uh, the Federalist Papers, the Constitution, all of those are important uh, sources of study as well. But I would submit that we put the Book of Mormon first and then use the Founding Fathers to support that study. And I believe if we do this, we'll be able to help our children, help ourselves, help our neighbors, help fellow ward members, be able to understand why liberty matters and how to fix the dangerous situation that we find ourselves in today. If we understand the Lord's perspective on liberty, as recorded in the Book of Mormon, we're going to be able to better understand the Constitution, which the Lord gave us. So turning to the Lord's revealed scripture is going to be far more effective and influential, simple and easy to grasp. So returning to these chapters in the Book of Mormon, what's the point that Mormon points out? Well, he points out how the effort of these corrupt lawyers and judges was to silence the gospel, to essentially make it hate speech. If you go read the story of Alma and Amulek in Ammonihah, and I'm going to translate it into 21st century language, we're basically having the same conversation we're having today about whether or not you can talk about the gospel, whether or not it's hate speech, and this effort that's being made in our society to criminalize teaching the gospel or living the gospel in the workplace, in uh, public spaces. Um, in the Book of Mormon, it's interesting what specifically about the gospel did Alma and Amulek focus on? What, what are they teaching the people in Ammonihah and why did that make them so upset? Well, they teach them true doctrine of judgment. They talk to them about accountability and justice and salvation that you need to change, that we're all fallen. This is the message that these lawyers and judges were trying to silence in the Book of Mormon. And if you look at our own day, it is also a chief message that is attempting to be canceled and silenced in our own public forums today. In Alma chapter 10, verses 26 and 29, we read about how the people in Ammonihah were trying to make Alma's words, the gospel, essentially illegal. In verse 13, the lawyers, by their cunning devices, were trying to catch them in their words and hand them over to who? The judges, so that they could be judged according to the law, using trickery, using the government to silence the righteous. As you continue through chapter 10 and verses 14 through 16, we are warned by Mormon about the danger of these corrupt lawyers. And this podcast is not meant to be a beat up on lawyers. I actually know several very good men who are lawyers. But in general, right, we're talking about a general problem in our society. You have lawyers that are not good intentioned, that are manipulating the system and they're twisting the laws. Just like in Ammonihah, in verses 26 through 27, they're twisting the laws. In verse 32, we read about how the lawyers were gaining from the problems. They didn't want to solve the contention among the people because they got a lot of money out of that. And of course, in chapter 11, verses 22, there's this effort to make these men deny that God lives. They wanted to deny the existence of God and, and twist them and trick them and basically bribe them to deny the existence of God. Now, what was the consequence of this attack on liberty? That What was the consequence? You know, Alma and Amulek, they show up and they don't just teach 
the doctrine of judgment. They don't just teach true salvation and principles of accountability and justice because, you know, just for fun. They did that very intentionally, and Mormon is including that very intentionally, trying to tell us, you know, these doctrines could help change people's hearts. These doctrines are what are missing. If people in America, if people in the world, if people in Utah or Virginia or any of these states understood these doctrines and believed them, it would expose the craftiness of these lawyers and judges and it would help turn the political system around. There's a reason why Mormon is putting this very intentionally in there. But what is the consequence of this silencing of the gospel? What is the consequence of these lawyers and these judges trying to shut this doctrine down? Christian persecution. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to talk about the martyrdoms in Ammonihah. We're going to talk about the rising Christian persecution in our own day. President Benson, in his book, God, Family, Country, similarly warned Latter-day Saints today that we are heading for similar persecution, that the consequence of these, the loss of checks and balances, that the consequence of these corrupt laws and Supreme Court decisions would result in persecution. He said, President J. Reuben Clark warned us that we, quote, stand in danger of losing our liberties and that once lost, only blood will bring them back. And once lost, We of this church will, in order to keep the church going forward, have more sacrifices to make and more persecutions to endure than we have yet known. That is a very sobering statement, considering the persecutions that happened during the Dark Ages, the persecutions that happened in Missouri, the suffering of our pioneer forefathers and foremothers. And yet we are being warned here, if we lose our liberties which we are as a society today, in order to keep the church going forward, in order to keep the gospel going forward so that the restoration is not lost, we, that's you and I, will have to make sacrifices greater and will have to endure persecutions greater than we have yet known. President Benson says he, Speaking of J. Reuben Clark, also stated that if the conspiracy comes here, it will probably come in its full vigor, and there will be a lot of vacant places among those who guide and direct not only this government, but also this church of ours. End quote. President Benson has warned us repeatedly, and so have many other leaders. The Book of Mormon is warning us repeatedly if we will take it seriously of the dangers that are coming in our day and of the consequences. President Benson on another occasion made this statement when he said, quote, if those who so carefully drafted the checks and balances into our constitution could have looked into the future and seen what the Supreme Court of the United States would do to their masterpiece, they would have been dismayed. Through the process of supposedly interpreting the constitution, The court has twisted beyond recognition just about every conceivable clause to justify the transfer of all sovereignty from the states to the federal government, to broaden the powers of the federal government beyond any definable limit, and then to make it possible for all such powers to fall into the hands of the executive branch of government. The checks and balances are gone. The Constitution has become but a piece of paper that, instead of protecting men's liberties against encroaching government, is now a source of phrases to be interpreted in such a way as to grant new and novel powers to government, end quote. Brothers and sisters, we are in the most sobering time of our nation to date. We're losing the battle We're losing our liberties. We're losing our freedom. Our liberty really is under condemnation. When the Lord in Doctrine and Covenants section 84 verses 54 through 57 spoke to the Latter-day Saints and told them that our minds are being darkened because of unbelief, because we've treated the Book of Mormon lightly, and that because of that vanity and unbelief, we have brought the whole church under condemnation. I believe that that condemnation we are feeling, not just in our homes, in our lives, 
or as a people, as Latter-day Saints, but that we are feeling that burden of condemnation in our nation. Our liberty is under attack and we are losing it. As I was preparing for this podcast and reading Mormon's warnings in these chapters of Alma and really feeling the anxiety, feeling, seeing the state that we are in as a people, I was just feeling over and over like, what do we do? What's the solution? How do we fix this mess? Because we can see it in the Book of Mormon. We can see the Book of Mormon pointing it out. And yes, I can, I can see some of the solutions, but how do all of us find hope? And as I was thinking about this and praying about this, you know, what do I finish with with this podcast? How do we how do we end on not a depressing note of death and destruction and and grief and condemnation, but what's the answer? I had this prompting that came to my mind. And I felt so clearly and so strongly that the promise of the Lord that the Book of Mormon has the answers is sure and it is solid. And we might not be able to see it now, but if we will put faith in that, if we will use the Book of Mormon, if we will turn to it, if we will convert ourselves, if we will convert our children, if we will turn to it with a humble heart and say, okay, God, this is the answer to turn liberty around in our nation. This is the answer to restoring the Constitution and saving it. How do we do this? I'm going to turn to the Book of Mormon. We're going to start using it. That God would open the way before us. We might not be able to see the entire way right now, but God will provide those answers for us. Kind of like Nephi being sent on that impossible mission to go and get the brass plates, right? It's impossible. And he tries every means to do it and he fails and he fails and he fails. But he turns to the Lord and the Lord says, you know, go to the city. And what does he find? He finds Laban sitting there. The way is literally prepared. The Lord just opened it up. He opened up the Red Sea for Moses. The Lord will do the same thing for us, but we have to take that first step of faith. We have to be obedient. And so far as a people, we have not been obedient as much as we should have. I'm including myself in that, but I have a growing conviction and testimony that if we will turn to the Lord and say, okay, God, you've told us that we can save the Constitution. You have promised it. You've told us that we can build Zion. We're ready to do it your way, and we're ready to use the Book of Mormon to do it. I'm going to turn to the Book of Mormon. I can promise you that if you will turn to the Lord, the Lord will open the way before us, and he will show us. He'll show us how to fix the laws in our nation. He'll show us how to fix the political system. He'll show us how to preserve liberty. And it will probably be different, completely different than how we think but I believe it will work. I believe that every vital political principle is in the Book of Mormon and not just in the Book of Mormon, but portrayed and written in the light that the Lord wishes us to study and apply it. If we are to save the Constitution, if we are to save our liberties, the Book of Mormon must become our first and foremost textbook and guide in that struggle and in that battle. No other solution will work but it will work. So as you're studying these chapters in Alma this week, and you're recognizing the parallels in our day, I would encourage every single one of us to get down on our knees and ask God what we can do to correct the problems in our nation and in our world and use the Book of Mormon to do it. 